Well, good day to you and welcome to the parable of the sower. In Matthew 13, the disciples have noticed that from now on, Jesus is only speaking in parables. And they've noticed this. He's changed his preaching style. And they ask him, why? Why have you chosen a different method? Why do you speak to them in parables? He, they say in verse 10. The answer he gives in verse 11. To you, it's been given to know the secrets of the kingdom of heaven. But to them, it's not been given. So parables give a good balance between God's desire for us to know the truth God's desire to share the secrets of the kingdom. But they give us a chance to respond. We see, to understand a parable, we have to think them through and chew them over. So parables provide a great balance between God's will and our will. You won't understand a parable without giving it quite a bit of thought. And in this parable, there are different levels of response. There are three responses that bear no fruit at all. And there are three fruitful responses. So I guess we'd all like to be the kind of ground that bears good fruit. That's what we'd like to be. Many years ago, the church of England didn't have to do evangelism. People just walked up to the path. And for the most part, people came every Sunday. That's been changing for a long time now. And we can't just assume that people are just gonna turn up for church. They're probably not. So we may have to become like the sower. We might have to become good at sowing the seed going out there in the world and recruiting people for the kingdom. New methods may be needed. So I'm going to begin by opening this up. And uh, this is one part of the picture. It's not by any means everything, but it's one part of what we, we may be required to do. What did the sower sow? Well, he sowed the word of the kingdom. Not his own words, his own thoughts, the word of the kingdom. And if you want to give this little talk a title, a little sort of slick phrase, you could say, if you want to sow it, get to know it. You have to have it, you see, before you can sow it. If you want to sow it, get to know it. And there's a lovely verse in James 1, 21, which says, receive with meekness the implanted word of God, which is able to save your souls. Receiving is something that we actively do. God offers it, but we commit to it by deciding to receive. And we receive with meekness in a, in, in a humble sort of way, not in a high-handed way. Receive. Another verse I like is Colossians 3.16. Allow the word of God to dwell in you richly. Allow this to happen. Give permission. We want the word of God in us abundantly, living in us richly. Isaiah 55.11 says, So shall my word be that goes forth from my mouth. It shall not return to me empty, but shall accomplish that which I purpose and prosper in the things for which I send it. The word of the Lord is sharper than a two-edged sword. Why does a house crumble? Why does a house fall? Well, Jesus says, he who comes to me and hears my words and does not do them is like a man who built his house upon the sand. 
The winds came, the storm came, the rains came and beat against that house. And great was the fall of it. It fell because it wasn't built on the foundation of the word. So decide, make that decision to allow the word in. Make a decision to receive the word. And now you're equipped with the right kind of seed. And now you're ready to go out and sow. So you've decided to <clears throat> allow the word to dwell in you richly. You've decided to give God permission to implant that word in you. But maybe you feel that every time you pick up the word, it's sort of snatched away. As in the parable, the birds come along and peck it up and it just doesn't stay. You can't get the word to stick. Whatever you do, it's just gone. Well, in the Old Testament, there's some good advice on how to get the word to stick. They used to say, bind it in your, on your arms, write it above the doorposts of your house. Today, I suppose, we would say, stick it on the fridge with a fridge magnet, or use a post-it note and stick it on the mirror in the bathroom. So that as you go around the house, you keep seeing it and it gets reinforced. The Old Testament's got other practical ways to make the word stick so that it doesn't get snatched away. Read it out loud. Read it to each other. Read it to people who you trust and get them to read it to you. Join a small group and discuss it. And the other way is, do you know what? If you read the scriptures and you feel nothing's happening, just say so. Pray it just like that. Dear Father, I pick up the word, I read it, and it doesn't make any sense. Please, Holy Spirit, give me the help I need. So that when I read it, it dwells within me and stays. You can be truthful with your Heavenly Father. Say it and pray it. Give me the help I need so the word sticks. Verse 21 talks about the seed that falls on rocky ground. When tribulation or persecution arises on account of the word... Persecution on account of the word is obvious in places like North Korea, where you can be sent to jail just for having one page of the Bible. Persecution on account of the word. Do you know that right now in parts of Athens, the Greek Orthodox Church are burning Bibles? They seem to have taken against the word. But when the Bible's taken away like that, it's obvious that there's persecution on account of the word. The persecution we face in the Western world is different. When you take a stand for scriptural truth, the affliction you meet is different. You get a snide kind of mocking. You can get a certain kind of ridicule or patronising comments, perhaps sarcasm. And... The current way of diluting the word, if you like, to make it less effective is not by taking the word away, but by adding things to it. People will say, well, we need the word and we need such and such as well. And when you say the word and in a way, well, definitely you're saying the word isn't good enough on its own. And that, of course, contradicts the founding articles of Anglicanism. The word isn't enough on its own. You need the word and, and if you listen for these ands, you'll hear them. And, you need the word and. So the seed is diluted, like watered down beer. So look out for this, that if you take a stand on the word, you might expect a level of persecution affliction they say sticks and stones may hurt my bones but words may never hurt me but cruel words have just as much an impact physical wounds might get better but 
wounding words can linger longer in the mind. And yes, the next thing that stops the word being fruitful in us is that the fact we may have to take a stand for it and defend the word. Perhaps that's why Jesus says, whoever is ashamed of me and my words, the Son of Man will be ashamed of them when he comes in his glory and in the glory of the Father and of the holy angels. That's in Luke 9, 26. So we may be required to take a stand for the word. So that's the second barrier we need to break through. And the final barrier we need to break through is the seed that falls among the thorns. This is fairly easy to understand. We receive the word, we take a stand for the word, we defend the word of the kingdom, but we get bogged down with other things, the cares of the world, the deceit of riches. And so it becomes just one thing of many, many more that occupy our lives and it becomes less and less important and its place is diminished it's sort of a minor hobby amongst many other things that have to be done and maintaining a balance between the spiritual and the physical life and of work has always been um, it's always required some thought it's never been that easy we have to provide for our families, look after our children, raise our grandchildren, take them to school. There's always a lot to do, but it's easy for these things to squeeze God out. So I guess that one's easy to understand, but hard to do. So let's assume we've got through these three levels of distraction and we're ready now to bear fruit. Well, there are three categories of fruit bearing. 30-fold, 60-fold and 100-fold. So I'm actually going to finish with just two things to remember. Um, having the word is a good place to start. But you also need to be pleasant and friendly with people. Take time to make friends. Make friends with people who do come to church. Make sure you know them all. Make friends with people. There's no shortcut on that one. You actually have to be kind to people and demonstrate love. And yes, that's important. That's another strand to this, how you treat people. And remember, you also need the supernatural help of the Holy Spirit. Don't try and do it on your own. Ask God for the power you need to get the job done. So may God help us all as we begin to explore ways of being fruitful. The Lord be with you as you journey through life. Amen.